<laughs> Alright, yeah, welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. This week we're taking a look at a subscriber submitted deck. This is Jeskai Bounce and Burn. It's a mix between control and tempo. We'll show you what I mean. And we're back. Okay, so essentially this deck wants to slow your opponent down while burning them for the rest of the turn. Burn in this meta game doesn't really have enough time to do its thing, so to have a little bit of bounce is actually quite a good idea. So you've got Jace as our first card, it allows you to loot into the cards that you want, and if you loot enough then he flips and you can plus one him to give a creature minus two minus zero, so that can slow your opponent down yet again. Plenty of ways in this deck to slow your opponent down and burn them in response. Minus three, you can cast an instant or sorcery from your graveyard. And essentially it gives it flashback for those who know that mechanic. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic, gets you your bounce back, gets you your burn back. You'll never really use your ultimate. I wouldn't ever aim to try do it. Unless, of course, you're in total control and you just really want to do it to be funny. But we're not a milling deck, so his ultimate is useless in this sense. Thing in the ice. Now, I'm not really sure about having thing in the ice in this deck. It's useful as a mass bounce spell when it flips, but I don't know if there's enough instants or sorceries to flip it. There's, as you can see, there's a lot of non-creature spells, but a lot of them are enchantments, so and also planeswalkers. So I'm not entirely sure whether thing in the ice is going to flip too often. It tends to be in a bigger control deck with a lot more instants and sorceries to make it truly useful. Uh, I haven't managed to get it to flip once yet, and I've usually beaten them by the time it's on one counter, so... Yeah, I'm not sure. If you were to cut this, then I would add either probably some more Telling Times and maybe another Sky Spawner or something like that. Just a bit more early game and a little less variance. One of the problems that I personally have with this deck is I think it's a little too variable. There's a lot of two drops and one drops. So the late game's a little bit iffy. You don't really know how you're going to win. It does make it a lot more interesting when you get to the end game, though, and you can win several different ways. But I personally prefer to win one specific way and know how that way is going to be so I can set up my early game turns. Sigiled Starfish does help with that. It allows you to scry one, and it is a 0-3 zero uh, zero blocker. So it's great to slow your opponent down, sets up your turns... It's a fantastic card. Yeah, again, I'd probably go for a 3 of if I was to improve work on this deck. Oath of Chandra. It's a 2 mana, 3 damage burn spell to a creature or opponent. And at the beginning of each end step, if a Planeswalker enters the battlefield, do 2 damage to each opponent. can also target Planeswalkers as well, which makes it quite useful. I think there are 4 or 5 Planeswalkers in this deck. So there's a fair few triggers off the second ability there. Telling time, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of those cards into your hand, one on top of your library and one on the bottom. So this is a great way to set up future turns. Uh, so you can refill your hand, you can set up your next draw step and you can get rid of the crap card that you really don't want. It's great. I would personally go for three of though. Declaration in stone, two mana, exile, target creature and all of the creatures that share the same name as that. And then you have to investigate for each non-token creature that got exiled. When it says non-token, you can target tokens and you'll wipe the board completely of that token type. So if your opponent's playing token decks, then this is perfect card against it. Otherwise, it's great for removing Ulamogs and recurring creatures and stuff like that. It's fantastic. Or if you've got a field full of, you know, three of the same creature, then it's great to get rid of that. Eldrazi Sky Spawner. This is probably one way to tempo out your opponent. So it's a 3 mana for a 2-1 flyer that also makes a 1-1 colourless scion. So it's sort of a little bit of ramp though you won't really be using it for that. You'll be using it as 3 damage spell to be honest. Uh, flying 2-1. Gonna get out the way. Evade over your opponent's creatures. There aren't many flyers to block it unless they're playing um, up artifacts and therefore the thopters can get taken out with declaration in stone and stuff like that reflector mage perfect tempo card so when it enters the battlefield you can bounce a creature and your opponent can't cast that creature on his next turn which does include the same name as that creature so if he's got two 
Sylvan Advocate, for example, and you've just bounced one, he can't play the other one, nor can he play the one you just bounced. So it's, it's great tempo play. Can get a little bit of a blocker out of the way as well to push through some extra damage. Uh, fevered Visions. At the beginning of each player's end step, that player draws a card. If that player is your opponent and has four or more cards in hand, it deals two damage to him or her. This two damage can be pointed towards Planeswalkers as well. Can't forget that. Uh, if you get this down on turn three, then it's likely to do about six damage before it gets removed, which is absolutely fantastic. If you're playing against Elves, though, they tend to have a um, some sort of enchantment removal. So it sometimes gets blown away, but in a control deck with our tempo style, we also get to draw off of this, so we get to keep our hand full. And the worst thing for an opponent playing against a control player is to have a control player with a full hand. So this is a great way to stay in in control and not lose it. Geist Blast. I love this card. Can't big it up enough. Two damage to target creature or player. So it's an alright burn spell. It's probably a great burn spell in this meta game where we don't have like lightning bolts and stuff like that. Uh, it also has a two and a blue. Exile it from your graveyard and copy instant or sorcery spell. You control and you may target new copy make new copies and targets with it um so you could copy a radiant flames and deal six damage to your opponent remember that the exact copy is made of this card so the x where the number of colors spent to cast it is still the same we made that mistake in the previous game didn't impact us but you know we figured out that we could actually do 6 damage off a of Radiant Flames, which makes a board wipe even better. You can also copy an Exquisite Firecraft, or even some of the late game uh, instants and sorceries like Part of the Water Veil. Perfect for a Geist Blast. Radiant Flames, as we mentioned, it's in a 3 colour deck, so we can get the full Converge to do 3 damage to each creature. That can blow away most players' boards. There's a lot of 3 toughness or less creatures in this meta game. So you're likely to make this a full board wipe, which is great. Exquisite Firecraft is usually the way that we're going to end the game. It deals 4 damage to target creature or player, and if you've got Spell Mastery online, then it's, uh, it cannot be countered, which speaks for itself. You can hit Planeswalkers with this as well, so Super Friends is going down. Um, yeah, there's not much to say about this card that has already been said. Royal Spout, some more bounce can have an awaken ability so that you can make a 4-4 land but mostly it's to slow your opponent down, screw up their draw step and keep yourself in control as well. Brutal Expulsion, awesome card. So you can choose one or both, you can either use it as a remand so you can counter a spell to put it back in their hand or you can bounce a creature and you can also deal 2 damage to target creature or planeswalker. Sadly it doesn't affect players but most of the time you want to do the 2 damage to a creature and bounce another creature. So it's a, a 4 mana bounce 2 creatures kind of card. It's pretty good. You can also copy it with Geist Blast. I think I've done that a few times in player testing. Great little card. So then we get on to how we plan to win. So Gideon, ally of Zendikar. Plus 1, he becomes a 5-5 five five with indestructible and no damage can be dealt to him. Or you can make a 2-2 two two white ally and start... Um, valuing out your opponent by making a lot of uh, creatures to attack him. And also you could emblem him to make your 2-2s, two 3-3s two, three and so on and so forth. Most of the time you find that you're making 2-2s two and swinging in with a plus 1 though. Hopefully we'll get to see that. It's likely how we're going to win. Nahiri. Nahiri is fantastic at setting up your hands. So a plus 2 ability is to discard a card, and if you do, you get to draw a card. So if you're drawn into a, your sixth land in a row, you're getting a bit pissed. Get your Nahiri to get rid of that land. You can hopefully, with your seventh, not get a land and get something decent. Also, she can come down and de destroy a lot of stuff for you. So she can exile target enchantment, tapped artifact, or tapped creature. So if your opponent's just swung in with a big creature, you can get it out after, the, after they've attacked and exile it away. Search your library for an artifact or creature, put it onto the battlefield and sh shuffle your library, it gains haste. This, I don't think will really happen. Uh, the best thing to get really is a Drowner of Hope or a Deep Fathom Skulker. 
Um, I'm not sure if you really should go for the ultimate on Nahiri. I think really you should plus her so that you can have more minus two abilities in the future. So you can control out your opponent, destroy their creatures, that sort of thing. Jace, Unraveler of Secrets, has a plus one to scry and draw. Great to set up your future turns, so your draws can be a lot better. You can also bounce creatures away so that you can get your Gideon through to get some more damage in. Or just simply get away a creature that they spent a lot of mana trying to get into the game. His minus eight ability is pretty good. If you could ultimate him, I would suggest that you do. You get an emblem with whenever an opponent casts his or her first spell each turn, counter that spell. So your opponent now gets two for one every single time. Every first spell they cast gets countered, so they have to throw a card away essentially to do what they really want to do. Drowner of Hope is one of the finishers in this game. So it enters, you put two 1-1 one, one Eldrazi Scions onto the battlefield, and you can sack them to tap creatures down. So you can clear the way for a Gideon, or you can clear the way for Drowner itself by tapping down your creatures. Keeps their biggest stuff down as well, if you're struggling a little bit and they've maybe made an Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. You can tap him down for two turns straight, and hopefully that's enough to finish out the game. Deep Fathom Skulker. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. So that's one card for each creature that deals combat damage. There aren't a great number of creatures in this deck. This is another late game card that I might cut. And also, I don't know if we've got... Hang on, let me check. I don't think we have... Yeah. We don't have the ability to do the colourless um, secondary ability. So personally, I would cut this and maybe add another Drowner if that's what we were hoped to do. If we want to creature them out, I'd get rid of the Deep Fathom and add another Drowner. It's just my personal opinion there. Part the Water Veil. If we've got a decent board and we're one turn away from winning, let's take an extra turn. So for six mana, you can take an extra turn, but it does get exiled, so there's no way to recur it. You can Geist Blast it, though, to copy it, so you can take two extra turns. It does stack. Although the card doesn't read like it should. Um, you can also awaken for 6. You take the extra turn and you also get a 6-6 six, six to f swing in for the victory. You've been bouncing their cards and burning their creatures all the time. So likely the board's pretty clear for a 6-6 six, six to come in and finish the, the game. Crush of Tentacles. Another way to bounce it. Return all non-land permanents to their owner's hands. If Crush of Tentacles surge cost was paid, you get to put an 8-8 eight, eight out. So, Mass Bounce, it could fill their hand for the Fevered Visions to start triggering again in the late game. Uh, it can also get rid of their expensive creatures, and if you've managed to surge it, then you've just got an 8-8 that's really difficult to profitably block. So, the Crush of Tentacles is great, and as well, if you... Um, actually, no, if you Geist Blast it, it wouldn't give you two 8-8s, because the first one would get bounced. So, yeah, scratch that. This isn't really a good Geist Blast um, target. Devil's Playground. This is a good uh, Geist Blast target. So you put 4-4, four, four, uh, four, one, one red devil tokens. And they have, when they die, deals 1 damage to target creature or player. So you essentially put out 4 Goblin Arsonists. So by the time you're playing this, they're on a really low life. And they don't really want to be attacking into you anymore. Because if you do, then you block and you ping them for 1. And that's usually all you need to clear out the game. If you Geist Blast, then you get 8 one ones which is fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I'd probably take Crushed Tentacles out maybe and make two Devil's Playgrounds, make two Drowner of Hopes instead of Deep Fathom. I'd make this, this end game a little less variable, a little less to chance, um, so that you'd know essentially how you're going to win. That, that's what I would do, but we're going to leave it since it is a, su a subscriber submit deck, but I will give you advice. My personal advice, anyway, you don't have to take it. So, the lands pretty much speak for themselves. Four plains, four islands, three mountains. We've got ways of searching them up with Evolving Wilds. But we want to make sure that we have all three colours in for Radiant Flames and stuff like that. The issue sometimes comes with a lot of doubles by turn three and four. Um, which can be a bit of an issue. Which is why we do have the Evolving Wilds in here at the end. We also have a lot of varied lands as well. So we have a one of Wandering Fumeral. 
You can make it into a 1-4, switch it, make it into a 4-1 whenever you want. That might be a good way to finish out the rest of the game. If you've been bouncing the creatures, they've got nothing to block with. So you can swing in with that 4. Neil Spires, very much the same thing, except this is a 4-mana 2-1 death uh, double strike. Same sort of deal as a Wandering Fumeral. We've got 2 of uh, Prairie Stream. You'll likely will have a lot of um, basics out at this point. Sometimes I find that you don't and you end up having these come in tapped. So I think the mana base could do with a little bit of a shift around. Um, but for the most part, it's a little difficult making a three mana base and making it work perfectly. Cliff top retreat, great two drop if you've just played a mountain or a plane. So it comes in untapped if you have a basic in play or if you have a prairie stream in play. Which is why they're, they're a great synergy together. Sulphur Falls speaks for itself, and I think so does Glacial Fortress. Alright guys, if you've enjoyed the deck, be sure to leave a like and comment how you would improve the deck. And if you've liked the look of it, then stick around for match number one. I'll see you guys shortly. Bye-bye. <laughs>